Dear friends, welcome to my History of the Christian Church, 2,000 Years of Christian Thought, and today we arrive at the person and the personality of Oregon. Born around 185, died around 253 AD. The Christian, who many believe, brought and developed Christian philosophy for the masses. Welcome to a deep dive into the enigmatic life of Christianity's theological trailblazer, Oregon. Join me as we embark today on a journey through the life and legacy of this man, the pioneering theologian who challenged the norms of his time and has left an indelible mark on Christian thought ever after. Get ready to uncover the controversies. Did he really castrate himself? The brilliance, but was he even orthodox? And the enduring influence of this enigmatic figure. Listen in and prepare to be intrigued, fascinated, maybe even angered by this controversial but brilliant early church father. Welcome to my history of the Christian church, 2000 years of Christian thought. Now, by way of introduction today, I'm going to do a big picture overview of this man, his life, and his teaching before returning in again to cover it in much more detail. Oregon, or Oregon of Alexandria, as he's sometimes called, was born about 185 AD and died, experts reckon, about 253 AD. He was an early Christian scholar, an aesthetic, a theologian, and he was born and spent certainly the first half of his life and his career in Alexandria. He was an incredibly prolific writer who wrote at least 2,000 treaties in multiple branches of theology, including textual criticism, Bible exploration, exegesis, as well as hermeneutics, homiletics, that's sermons by the way, and other philosophical Christian writing. He is one of the most influential and controversial figures in early Christian theology, politics, and aestheticism. He has even been described by many as the greatest genius the early church ever produced, but it also has to be said he is one of its most controversial figures. Oregon, it seems, was committed to his Christian faith from a very early age, so much so that once as a young child he sought martyrdom, but was prevented by his mother from turning himself into the authorities. When he was around 18 years old, Oregon became a catechist a baptismal candidate at the Kachiketal School of Alexandria. Whilst there, he devoted himself to serious study and adopted an early aesthetic lifestyle. But very early on, he came into conflict with Demetrius, the Bishop of Alexandria, but still found a way to be ordained as a presbyter by his friend and then one might say rival regional bishop of Caesarea. He did that whilst on a journey to Athens via Palestine. Demetrius condemned Oregon for this, saying it was insubordination and he even accused him of having castrated himself and having taught that Satan would eventually attain salvation, an accusation which Oregon himself vehemently denied, but many would say these accusations followed him around for the rest of his life and ever since. Oregon would later found the Christian school of Caesarea where he taught logic, cosmology, natural history and theology and he soon became regarded by the churches of Palestine and Arabia as the ultimate authority on all matters of theology. Later in his life we actually find that he was tortured for his faith during what was called the Decian persecution in around 250 and died shortly after, probably as a result of the injuries he received in that persecution and torture. Oregon produced a massive quantities of writing during his life, helped in fact by the patronage of his close friend Ambrose of Alexandra, because he provided him with a team of secretaries to copy down all his work, thereby enabling him to be one if not the most prolific writer in all of antiquity. 
His early first fully formed work was called On the First Principles. It systematically laid out the basic principles of Christian theology and became a foundation and template for many later theological writings and musings. He also authored a work called Contra Celsum, seen as the most influential work of early Christian apologetics in which he defended Christianity against this pagan philosopher called Celsus, one of Christianity's earliest and foremost critics. Oregon would also go on to produce versions of something referred to as Hexapla, the first critical edition of the Hebrew Bible, which contained not only the original Hebrew text, but as well as four different Greek translations alongside it and one Greek transliteration of the Hebrew, all written in columns side by side. He also wrote hundreds of sermons covering almost the entire Bible as we know it today in choosing to interpret many passages as in fact allegorical. Oregon hoped that all people might eventually attain salvation but was always careful to maintain that this was only speculation. He defended free will but he also, many would say, advocated for an early form of Christian pacifism. Oregon is considered by most Christians worldwide to be a church father. He is still widely regarded as one of the most influential Christian theologians of all time. His teaching were certainly especially influential in the East, with the likes of Athenaeus of Alexandria and three of the Cappadocian fathers being among his most devoted followers. Argument over his orthodoxy and the orthodoxy of his teachings spawned the first what was called the Oregonist crisis in the later fourth century in which he was attacked by well-known church theologians of that time a guy called Epiphanes of Salimus and indeed Jerome himself but he was defended by other theological heavyweights by the likes of Tyrrhenius Rufus and John of Jerusalem. In 543 AD several hundred years after his death, Emperor Justinian condemned him as a heretic and ordered that all of his writing be burned. Some would say the Second Council, which took place in 553 AD, actually anathematized Oregon, but many would say that more accurately what they did is they condemned certain heretical writings and teachings which were claimed to have been derived from Oregon, which is a slightly different thing. It has to be said, in fairness, that his teaching on the pre-existence of the soul was pretty much universally rejected by the church. So that's an overview of his life, his teachings and his legacy. Let's now take a little bit of a deep dive, and I'd like to do that by beginning with a biography, focusing initially on his early years. So before we dive into the life of Oregon, we need to understand that there's a bit of historical detective work always when considering the life and teachings of people from antiquity so far back in this era. Most of what we know about Oregon's life comes from a detailed biography penned of him by someone called Eusebius. He was a very well-known Christian historian who wrote it about 50 years after Oregon's death. Now Eusebius himself didn't actually have a trove of reliable sources to draw on, especially when it comes to Oregon's early days. And it has to be also said that Eusebius was eager to paint Oregon as an Orthodox Christian scholar and almost a sort of saint in the making. Eusebius therefore pieced together Oregon's life from bits of hearsay and indeed it's fair to say some speculation. So trying to pull a biography together, historians say, is a bit like trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle with some of the pieces missing. What we do know is that Oregon entered the world around about 185 or maybe 186 AD. He was born in Alexandria, and according to some accounts, a guy called Pufri, another ancient thinker and writer, described him as a Greek lad who soaked up Greek literature like a sponge. 
His father, Leonides, was not an intellectual slouch either. He was a well-respected teacher of literature and himself a devout Christian. In fact, his father ended up getting martyred for his faith and thereby earned a spot on the roll of saints of the early church. Now, Leonides, his father, was of course well known when Oregon was growing up and because of his martyrdom was also recorded in the annals of church history but Oregon's mother her name has been lost to history probably because she wasn't rubbing shoulders with some of the elites as was her husband at that time some reckon and speculate that if she was from the lower rungs of society which meant this was the reason that Oregon himself as a child of this lower class mother wasn't able to identify himself as a Roman citizen but Oregon's father was. But what we also know is that Oregon's father didn't just treat his son the classics of Greek literature, he also made him memorize scripture as part of his daily chores. When Oregon was around about 16 things got difficult. The Roman emperor at the time Septimus Severus wasn't exactly throwing a party for the Christians. In fact, he ordered the execution of any Roman citizens who professed their faith openly. Leonides' father got caught up in this mess, landing himself in prison and ultimately, physically, literally losing his head. So these were tough times indeed. Oregon's in emotional turmoil wanted to follow in his father's footsteps and he was ready to present himself to face the executioner's axe himself but his mother wasn't having it and she did everything she could to stop him in fact she hid his clothes effectively grinding him but it seems likely that even if he turned himself in he wouldn't have actually faced execution since the emperor yes he was persecuting but at that time he was only interested in persecuting roman citizens who had converted and as such oregon wouldn't have qualified but in this persecution and the execution of his father oregon's family lost everything and he, as the eldest of nine siblings in his early life, had to step in and provide for everyone. At 18, likely because of his recognised intellect, Oregon obtained the role as a catechist at the Catechetal School of Alexandria, which was a school for those seeking baptism and where they would be instructed in the basics of the Christian faith. Some write that he may indeed have become head boy there and maybe even an early teacher but other experts suggest that speculation is a bit of a stretch. More likely the role of head boy doesn't exist but it is entirely possible that he was recruited as another teacher because of his intellectual ability and he would have been interested in that for the facility it would have enabled him to put food on the table for his family. But the school was no cakewalk for Oregon. He worked very hard and during that time he embraced the aesthetic life like many would say the Greek philosophers of that time but applying it in a Christian format which involved teaching by day, burning the midnight oil with his writings and living a very simple aesthetic lifestyle. He's described as dressing as a minimalist, owning only one cloak and he gave up drinking wine and ate a very simple basic diet as well as fasting regularly. Eusebius paints Oregon as a sort of monk in the making and of course he was used as an early example of a monastic style of living but other historians would say that's not fair or accurate and it's a bit of fitting a square peg in a round hole after the event. According to Eusebius, as a young man, Oregon was taken in by a wealthy Gnostic woman who was also the patron of a very influential Gnostic theologian from Antioch who frequently lectured in her home. Eusebius went to great lengths, however, to insist that although Oregon studied whilst in her home and benefited from her sponsorship, it is declared that he never once, as is, was described, prayed in common with her or the Gnostic theologian based there. Later, in fact, this exposure to Gnostic teaching held Oregon in good stead because he succeeded in converting a wealthy man 
named Ambrose, famous for being a Gnostic, moving him from a position of what was called Valentinian Gnosticism to embrace Orthodox Christianity. Ambrose, after that event, was so impressed by the young scholar that he gave Oregon a house and a secretary, plus seven stenographers, as well as additional copyists and calligraphers, and he paid for all of them in the helping of producing versions of, of his writings and allowing them to be published. Sometime when he was roughly in his early 20s, Oregon sold the small library of Greek literary works which he had inherited from his father as a teacher of Greek literature, that's what he did, and he sold them for a sum which he then converted into a regular income, and he used this money to continue his study of the Bible and of the newly developing discipline of Christian philosophy. So during this time, Oregon travelled extensively, and he studied at numerous schools, not just in Alexander. In fact, he studied at the Platonic Academy of Alexander for a while, but he also moved around studying under Clement of Alexandria. Although it has to be said, Oregon later would rarely mention Clement in any of his own writings, and when he did, it was usually to correct him. Eusebius also writes that as a young man, he followed a literal reading of Matthew 19.12. Let me just read what that says for you. It's a passage where Jesus is presented as saying, For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Because of that, and certainly Oregon, it's like he lived a life where he abstained from sexual activity, but a rumour developed around Oregon that he'd actually castrated himself or had someone else castrate him in order to ensure his reputation is respectable. The writing at that time says he did that in order that he could protect his reputation as a tutor to both young men and young women. Eusebius further alleges that Oregon privately told Demetrius, the Bishop of Alexander, about the castration and that Demetrius initially praised him for his devotion to God on account of it. Oregon, however, interestingly, never mentions anything about castrating himself in any of his surviving writings. And in fact, in his exegesis of this verse, in his lengthy commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, which was written towards the end of his life, he actually strongly condemns any literal interpretation of Matthew 19.12, asserting that only an idiot would interpret that passage as advocating literal translation. Rather, it was a call for sexual propriety. You see, it was the fact that Eusebius, in his account of Oregon's life, puts out this theory of self-castration and says that he believes it, but this is probably, more likely, modern historians would say, was that Eusebius was such an ardent admirer, a fan of Oregon, he wanted to present Oregon in the highest, as he saw it, Christian aesthetic lifestyle. Yet Oregon himself describes castration, literal castration, as an act of pure folly. Although it has to be said that some see Oregon's condemnation of the literal interpretation of this passage as him tacitly repudiating the literal reading that he had acted on impulsively in his youth. Today, most dismiss Eusebius' stories or Oregon's self-castration as not credible, seeing it, in fact, as a deliberate attempt by Eusebius to distract from the more serious questions regarding the general orthodoxy of his teaching. Ultimately, we can't even accept that any potential motive of castration, being that of respectability and having good regard in the fact that as a teacher of mixed gender classes and the fact that Oregon took one-to-one -one female students, who Eusebius in his history actually lists all his students by name. The fact is, modern historians say those students would always have been accompanied by attendants at all times particularly the females, meaning that Oregon would not have had that reason to think that anyone would suspect him of impropriety. Perhaps Eusebius was just uncritically reporting malicious gossip circulated by Oregon's enemies, and let's be clear, there were many of those, and most noted historians today continue to find no reason to conclude 
that the story might be true or false. Oregon moved from school to school. As I say, he passed through schools in Alexander, even rubbing shoulders with the big names of the Platonic Academy. But during this time, Eusebius writes that he was still under the wing of Clement of Alexandria. But some scholars think that that position comes more out of the fact that it's based on the similar teachings that, and writings that they had at that time. Moving on to his midlife adventures, we move into his early 20s. At this point, it could be said that Oregon decided to shift his focus somewhat. He stepped away from his role as a writer and Bible commentator and embraced a new identity as a sort of early Christian philosopher, passing on his teaching responsibilities to a younger college at the school in Alexandra, and he started styling himself as a sort of master of philosophy. Now, this transition didn't sit well with Demetrius, the influential bishop of Alexandra, and Demetrius was always focused on maintaining control over his students, and this was seen as an assertion of independence by Oregon, as his change of identity to a Christian philosopher indirectly challenged the authority of Demetrius above him. So whilst navigating these tensions where he was based, Oregon became busy with significant other academic pursuits. He, in fact, at this point embarked on the monumental task of composing what many consider his theological masterpiece called On the First Principles. This is a book which would profoundly shape Christian thought for generations. Meanwhile, at the same time, he also embarked on journeys across the whole Mediterranean, visiting various theological and philosophical schools. In 212, Oregon finds himself in Rome, a hub of philosophical discussions at that time. He was said to have attended lectures by Hippolytus of Rome, absorbing his insights and what was particularly coming to the fore at that time, that which is called Logos theology. Shortly after, in 213-214, the governor of Arabia sought Oregon's wisdom on Christianity, leading to an enlightening exchange between them. Events, however, took a tumultuous turn in 215 when Emperor Caracalla visited Alexandria. Tensions escalated, leading to chaos and violence. Oregon, sensing the danger that he was in, fled to Caesarea in Palestine. And there he found refuge under the patronage of the bishop there called Theocritus, who invited him to preach in their churches around the region, despite at that time his lacking formal ordination or accreditation. Demetrius, back in Alexandria, was outraged by this perceived challenge to his authority, and he demanded that Oregon return, and he denounced the Palestinian bishops for allowing Oregon to preach in their churches without proper credentials. Oregon, instead of returning, persisted with his teaching and wrote back, in fact, seeking ordination as a priest from Demetrius in order to continue his work, but his requests were continually denied. Around 231, Demetrius dispatched Oregon on a mission to Athens. However, on that journey, Oregon made a deliberate detour to Caesarea, where he was warmly received by the bishops there called Theocritus and Alexander, with whom he'd formed close ties during previous visits. During his stay in Caesarea, Oregon approached Theocritus and requested ordination as a priest there, a request to which Theocritus happily agreed. However, upon learning of Oregon's ordination by a bishop from outside the Alexandria area, Demetrius was incensed and he issued a condemnation arguing that such an organization contributed an act of insubordination and usurping of church authority. Reluctantly, Oregon returned to Alexandria but not before acquiring a very ancient scroll containing the Hebrew Bible. It was this that inspired him to his in-depth study of the Old Testament. So whilst all this is going on, upon another request by another patron named Ambrose, Oregon produced extensive Bible commentaries on the Gospel of John, Genesis, Psalms and Lamentations. 
Additionally, he is supposed to have produced a work on the resurrection of Jesus and composed his book Stromata, which was a general catch-all book covering a wide range of theological topics. All of these activities further straining his relationship with Demetrius to the point that he demanded his removal back to Caesarea. So Oregon, having completed most of his commissions, Eusebius reports that he returns to face Demetrius's condemnation. But at the last minute, Oregon decides against returning to Alexandria and extends, instead opts for permanent residence in Caesarea, where the local bishops are well disposed to him. In fact, the bishops in Palestine hailed Oregon as the chief theologian of Caesarea and the surrounding area, and the bishop of Caesarea, based in Cappadocia, fervently requested Oregon to come and teach also in his region. Demetrius, upon hearing this, unleashed a storm of protest against him and the bishops of Palestine, and even conveyed a church synod in Rome to rally support against Oregon. Eusebius records Demetrius' allegations against him, including that, of course, the old chestnut of self-castration, which was a capital offence under Roman law that would have immediately invalidated Oregon's ordination. Demetrius also accused Oregon of promoting an extreme form of the restoration of creation to a condition of perfection, accusing him of teaching a form of Christian universalism that includes the ultimate salvation of everyone, including the damned in hell, asserting that even Satan himself would and could attain salvation. Oregon's defence centred on the accusation that the devil's fate was in fact determined by his own choices, free will, not divine predestination. We know that Demetrius, his number one accuser and troublemaker, himself passed away in 232, less than a year after Oregon left the Alexandria region. Now whilst the accusations against Oregon subsided after Demetrius' death, the rumours and the, the challenges continued to linger, casting a shadow over his subsequent career, and his legacy to this day has been affected by it. Universalists will still try and use Oregon as a poster boy to their cause. This, in my estimation, however, is completely disingenuous, because when Oregon himself was challenged with it, he defended himself vigorously against that accusation, and in a letter addressed to his friends in Alexander, he vehemently denied the accusation and dismissed the notion of Satan's potential salvation. So ironic that people themselves would still use him to back that false premise. Upon settling in Caesarea, Oregon focused on establishing a Christian school there, filling the void as he saw in the city's educational landscape. The school targeted pagan individuals, any people currently outside the church who were interested in Christianity, and he offered a teaching of Christianity based, it said, very much in a Greek philosophical worldview, Middle Platonism, if you want to get exact about it. You see, Oregon was teaching into a Greek culture with Greek students, and therefore he emphasized a progression as he sought from Socratic reasoning to cosmology through natural history, all ultimately leading to a Christian theological worldview, which he presented as the finical of philosophical thought and inquiry to students based on coming from that background. Whilst in that position of leading the Caesarean school, Oregon's star as a scholar and theologian soared to its highest point, earning him renown and fame across the entire Mediterranean as a brilliant intellectual. The hierarchy of the Palestinian and the Arabian church synods declared and held Oregon in the highest esteem, and they in fact, in reality, regarded him pretty much as the ultimate authority on all matters of theology that they wanted to discuss. During this time of teaching in Caesarea, Oregon resumed his work on his massive commentary on John, completing six 
a series of books, th over 30 books long, and it is believed during this time he bo completed books 6 through 10. Additionally, during this time, at the request again of his friend Ambrose, Oregon penned his famous treatise on prayer. In it, he meticulously dissects the various types of prayers outlined in the Bible and provides a very sophisticated analysis and lengthy analysis of the Lord's Prayer. Oregon's intellectual pulling power had such force that it attracted the attention of many pagans and philosophers from across the whole Middle East and Mediterranean world. The Neoplatonic philosopher Poffrey, upon hearing of Oregon's renowned, journeyed all the way to Caesarea to sit in on his lectures. Writing upon that, Poffrey acknowledged Oregon's comprehensive study and knowledge of both Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, and all the major Middle Platonists. However, he criticized Oregon for supposedly compromising true philosophy by subjecting its insights and putting them under the authority of a Christian scriptural exegesis. Eusebius even tells us that Oregon at one point was summoned to Antioch by Julia Avita Mamia, the mother of the Roman Emperor Severus Alexander, for discussions on Christian philosophy and doctrine there. In 235, approximately three years into his tenure in Caesarea, the tolerant attitude towards Christians under Roman Emperor Alexander Severus ended suddenly and abruptly with his assassination. Replaced by Emperor Maximus Thrax, a subsequent purge targeted Christian leaders, resulting in the exile of even the current Pope of that time, Pontiatus, and important Christian figures like Hippocleitus of Rome. Sensing the imminent danger, Oregon sought refuge in the home of Juliana the Virgin, a devout Christian and a former disciple of the Ebonite Christian leader, Symmachus. During this tumultuous period, Oregon's dear friend and benefactor Ambrose was arrested in Nicodemia, along with the prominent priests and leaders based in Seir. They all met a similar fate. In honor of their unwavering faith in undergoing persecution, Oregon penned the exhortation to martyrdom, a highly respected piece of Christian resistant literature to this day is used by those facing persecution. Merging from hiding after Maximinus's death, Oregon again discovered a school which had dragged Gregory, a future bishop of Pontiquus, among his pupils. He delivered regular sermons there, initially on Wednesdays and Fridays, which later extended to daily addresses and many messages, many of them recorded and scribed by his secretaries. Moving on to his later life, between 238 and 244, Oregon embarked on a series of travels, starting with a visit to Athens, where he put the finishing touches on his famous commentary on the book of Ezekiel, and then began work on his commentary on the Songs of Songs. From Athens, he makes his way to Nicodemia to catch up with his old friend Ambrose, and according to Poffrey, Oregon may also have made stops in Rome and Antioch, where he purportedly crosses path with Pluntius, the esteemed founder of Neoplatonism. During this time of his travelling, Oregon remains a revered figure among Eastern Mediterranean Christians and is seen as a paragon of theological orthodoxy. But when the hierarchies in Palestine get wind of the Bishop of Bostra preaching what was then going to be called adoptionism, an idea suggesting that Jesus was just an ordinary man who only became divine after his baptism, they dispatch Oregon to set things straight in that area. Oregon engaged with Berilius in a public debate and in fact successfully convinced in getting him to adopt Oregon's theological stance thereafter in that region. On another occasion, a Christian le leader named Hercleides in Arabia, stirred controversy by proclaiming the soul's mortality, claiming it perished with the body. Oregon again was called to intervene, vehemently and effectively arguing for the soul's immortality and eternal existence. 
in 249, a pig was seen to sweep through the region. And by 250, the emperor, a guy at that point called Decius, attributes the plagues to Christians and their refusal to acknowledge his divinity. And that unleashes a wave of persecutions against Christians across the Roman Empire. This time, Oregon wasn't spared. Eusebius recounts Oregon's harrowing ordeal of being captured and enduring literal, physical, bodily torture and imprisonment, included being confined and stocked with his feet stretched, as was described, four, four spaces apart, something which must have been incredibly debilitating and challenging for someone quite advanced in years. The governor of Caesarea issued explicit orders that they must keep Oregon alive during this process until they could get him to renounce his Christian faith publicly. Despite enduring two years of this type of torture and incarceration, Oregon remained steadfast, refusing to renounce his belief. In 251, when Dethius himself died at the Battle of Aberitis, Oregon was finally released from prison. However, the physical toll of this ordeal proved too much. He passed away within a year, approximately nine months later, some would say, at the age of 69. His death likely due to the injuries he sustained during his imprisonment and torture. So that's his life. What about his writings? Well, we'll divide them up into various sections. First of all, his exegetal writings. In other words, his critical exploration and exploration, explanation and interpretation of actual biblical texts. Oregon's literary input is nothing short of staggering. Epiphanius claims he penned around 6,000 works throughout his lifetime. Now that's an estimate most scholars consider to be a bit inflated, yet even having said that, Eusebius catalogues nearly 2,000 titles by Oregon, and at Jerome, when he produces a list of what he considers to be the most important writings of Oregon, he lists over 800 of what he calls major works. Arguably, his most significant contribution to textual criticism, anyway, was his Hexpala, literally translated to sixfold, a monumental study comparing various translations of the Old Testament across six columns. Hebrew, Hebrew and Greek, Hebrew and Greek characters, the Septuagint, and four other Greek translations. In this work, Oregon creatively introduced symbols borrowed from Alexandria's famed textual critics, an asterisk mark passages found in the Septuagint but not in the Hebrew text, whilst an obelisk denoted passages absent in the Septuagint but present in other Greek translation. This hexpala formed the cornerstone of the great library of Caesarea, established by Oregon himself and remained unwell of Christian thought and writing right up into Jerome's era. Years later, when Emperor Constantine was Emperor of Rome, he commissioned 50 copies of the Bible for widespread dissemination around the empire. And Eusebius writes that he relied on the Hexpala of the Old Testament to be the master text for those. Now, of course, the original Hexpala is lost, but fragments survive, and those fragments prove at least that he preserved the original text with relative accuracy based on where we can cross-reference it. In certain sections, Oregon expanded the Hexpala with additional columns featuring more Greek translations. Those areas that have additional columns are for the Psalms, where for them alone, he included a further staggering eight Greek versions, doubling this section, the Enpala, the ninefold. He also later crafted a simple Tetrapala, the fourfold version, a condensed version excluding the Hebrew text. Jerome's own writing in his 33rd letter, he attests to Oregon's extensive commentaries being available on both Exodus, Leviticus, Isaiah, Psalms, well, the first 15 Psalms anyway, Ecclesiastes, and, of course, his massive Gospel of John commentary. 
While complete versions of these commentaries still elude us, fragments were amalgamated into what was called the Cantinia, a compilation of excerpts from major biblical commentaries by the Church Fathers that appeared some years later. Additional snippets of Oregon's writings are found in the Philokaya and a pamphlet of Caesarea's defense of Oregon. Oregon's famous Stromatus book, it shared a similar vein and has been lost to antiquity, but many aspects and citations from that work, particularly on Romans and 1 Corinthians and other fragments, are found elsewhere or referred to in other writings. Notably, Oregon also composed homilies, sermons, spanning nearly the entire Bible. Now, not all of those are available today, but somewhere between two and three hundred are still available to be read today in both their Greek and Latin versions. The preserved sermons cover a wide array of biblical books. There are 16 from the book of Genesis, 13 from Exodus, 16 from Leviticus, 28 from Numbers. 26 sermons are found covering passages from Joshua and nine from Judges. From 1 Samuel, there are two. From Psalms, there are nine. From Isaiah, there are nine. From Jeremiah, there are seven Greek, two Latin, and Ezekiel, 14. And Luke, 39 separate sermons extrapolated from the text. Now, these sermons were predominantly delivered in the churches at Caesarea, except for the series on 1 Samuel, which is recorded as, as have been given in Jerusalem. Some scholars theorize that these sermons were delivered within a three-year liturgical cycle and all given between 238 and 244, and in fact preceded Oregon's commentary on the Psalm of Songs, in which he makes references to homilies and judges, Exodus, Numbers, and Leviticus. Interestingly, as recently as 2012, the Bavarian State Library revealed the discovery of 29 previously unknown sermons by Oregon, from a text believed to have been written in the 12th century from Byzantine manuscripts from their collections. Experts have authorized these texts and they have helped expand our understanding of Oregon's teachings, particularly as sermon homilies at that time. Oregon's significance also extends to his role in shaping what we describe as the New Testament, the New Testament canon of Scripture. The late 4th century Easter letters, as they were called, and within them was a list of accepted Christian writings from that time, and that list includes works by Oregon. Regarding the New Testament texts themselves, Oregon unequivocally affirms the authenticity of 1 John, 1 Peter and Jude, he also referenced 2 John, 3 John, and 2 Peter, but acknowledged some suspicions that he had about the actual authorship. Now, whilst it can't be said that Oregon didn't originate the concept of a biblical New Testament canon of Scripture, his interpretations and his use of passages provide a solid philosophical and literary framework that have underpinned and supported the idea of the, the canon as we see it today. In terms of his commentaries, Oregon's commentaries on specific books of scripture take a more systematic approach compared to his sermons. But what these work highlight is Oregon's vast knowledge across various subjects and his remarkable ability to cross-reference works meticulously, listing every occurrence of word in scripture along with its various meanings. And this is an impressive feat considering the absence of computers or even Bible concordances at that time. As just one example, his monumental commentary on the Gospel of John spanned over 32 volumes and was aimed not only to reveal the correct interpretation of Scripture, but also to refute the teaching of the Gnostics. Now, unfortunately today, only nine of those original 32 have survived, but the substantial authenticated texts, they still remain and they give us an amazing insight into what is a monumental work that this must have been. Quoting for you just from his own introduction to John chapter 1 about the Gospel of John, Oregon writes this, 
as the law contains a shadow of good things to come so the gospel which is thought to be capable of being understood by anyone teaches a shadow of the mysteries of christ paul could not benefit the jews without circumcising timothy so also he who is responsible for the good of many cannot operate only according to secret christianity that will never enable him to help those who are following the eternal christianity or to lead them on to a higher or better things we must both be carnal and spiritual christians where a carnal gospel is necessary with those who are carnal we know nothing but jesus christ and him crucified and that is what we must preach but it is different with those who are perfect in spirit bearing fruit and loving and heavenly wisdom these must be made to partake of the word after he has made the flesh rose again to the position which he held in the beginning with god so there he is absolutely affirming the orthodoxy of scripture and its benefit particularly with John, in speaking the gospel message into a Greek worldview, but in effect saying that we are called to go above and beyond those things as Christians born again of the spiritual of God. Similarly, on the 25 books in Oregon's commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, only eight remain available in the original Greek, covering a portion of about a third of Matthew's text. His commentary on Matthew continues to this day to be admired as a classic. In fact, many would say it solidified Matthew's gospel as being the primary New Testament introductory text and has stayed that way in many Bibles to this day. His commentary in the Epistle to the Romans, originally 15 books long, has only survived in small fragments in Greek. However, a condensed Latin version of 10 books of it was created a little bit later in the 4th century, and that is pretty much intact. His commentary on the Song of Songs stands out as the most respected work in the genre of Old Testament commentaries. Here, in it, Oregon meticulously explains the relevance of the Song of Songs to a Christian audience, not just, not just the Jewish community into which it was first delivered. In his preface, Jerome, in writing a preface to that work, praises Oregon's exceptional work, remarking that Oregon surpassed his, indeed, even his own highest standards in the production of this commentary on the Song of Songs. Oregon interprets the Song of Songs allegorically. That was, was the call we see him encouraging us to take in our approach to Old Testament scriptures from that section I read to you from John earlier, and in it, he allegorically places the bridegroom as symbolizing the logos and the bride representing the believer's soul, an interpretation that would greatly influence later readings of many biblical texts. Again, only fragments remain, but a full Latin translation 410 provides pretty full insight into Oregon's thoughts on this book. Now, only fragments of the other commentaries have survived to this day and their structure and the amount is rather limited leaving much scholarly speculation as to what what they said but few would argue that they didn't exist in the first place moving on to his ground breaking ground shaking book on the first principle it stands in church history as the earliest systematic presentation of christian theology and it itself is divided into four books on god the world freedom and the scriptures the bible itself he crafted this seminal work during his younger years many believe writing it roughly between 220 and 230 whilst he was still living in alexandria now fragments from book three and book four of the original greek manuscript are available and preserved and smaller excerpts can be found quoted in other commentaries and letters from that era however again the bulk of the text is not available in the original but has come down to us in the form of a condensed latin translation dating to around 397. the original opening essay of first principles sets the stage for looking into what he sees as the essence of theology 
as I said, divided into four books. In book one, he ventures into what he calls the celestial realm, exploring topics such as the unity of God, the intricate relationships between the three persons of the Trinity and the essence of the divine spirit, as well as the roles and reasons for angels as he sees them. Book two is called The Transition to the Human Realm, discussing pivotal Christian concepts like the incarnation of the Logos, the nature of the soul, the concept of free wills, and indeed the realms of eschatology and end times theology. Book three looks into the broader cosmological themes, grappling with subjects such as the origin of sin and the path to redemption. And then book four tackles what's called teleology, examining the purposeful design behind creation and he offers early insights into the interpretation of scriptures trying to provide a comprehensive framework for anybody to understand the christian faith and how they might approach the bible text themselves perhaps his overall theology from this book is best quoted from that work itself in first principles chapter 1 verses 2 to 5 he says this it seems necessary, first of all, to lay down an unmissable rule regarding fundamental questions and then move on to investigate other points. The teaching of the church has been transmitted in orderly succession from the apostles and remains in the church to this present day. That alone is what can be accepted as true which in no way conflicts with the tradition of the church and the apostles. The holy apostles went preaching the faith of Christ to certain points which they believed to be necessary for everyone, and they delivered them in the clearest way. These they taught even to those who appeared rather dull in their investigation of divine knowledge. They left those who would deserve the highest gifts of the Spirit to examine the grounds of their statements. The kind of doctrines which are clearly delivered in the teachings of the apostles are as follows. Firstly, there is one God. Secondly, that Jesus Christ himself was born of the Father before all creatures. Thirdly, that the Holy Spirit was associated in honour and dignity with the Father and Son. After these points, the apostolic teaching is that the soul shall, after its departure from the world, be rewarded according to its deserts. Regarding the devil and the dizzy and chills of the opposing spiritual powers, the teaching of the church lays down that these beings indeed exist. It is also part of the church's teaching that the world was made and began at a certain time and that it is to be destroyed on the account of wickedness. Then finally that the scriptures were written by the Spirit of God and that they have not only an obvious meaning but also another meaning which escapes the notice of most people. Many principles the church would hold to this day and I'm sure you've noticed in that also an echo of foundational creeds of faith which will be issued in church history subsequently. Okay, his other great work against Celsius. Oregon's book against Celsius stands as his final work, written probably around 248 AD, and this work was written as an apologetic defense of Orthodox Christianity against the assaults of a then very prominent pagan philosopher called Celsius, the most formidable opponent of early Christianity in those days. Back in 178 AD, Celsius had launched a scathing polemic titled On the True Word, levelling a barrage of criticisms against Christianity and against Celsius stands as a comprehensive response, response to him and all future criticisms that the church might encounter. Initially, the Christian community chose to ignore, overlook Celsius' diatribes. However, Oregon's patron Ambrose brought the matter of this attack on the church to his attention. Now, although Oregon was initially inclined to disregard Celsius' attacks, not give them the oxygen of publicity, so to speak, just let them dissipate and die out, one particular claim that Celsius was making particularly caught Oregon's attention. Because Celsius had enraged Oregon by arguing that no serious philosopher from the Platonic tradition would ever stoop, as he put it, to embrace Christianity. 
It was that assertion that spurred Oregon to mount a robust rebuttal. In this book against Celsius, Oregon meticulously dissects each of Celsius's arguments, presenting a rational defense of the Christian faith, drawing heavily on the varied Platonic teachings that Celsius was trying to use against the church. Oregon thereby contends that Christianity and Greek philosophy are not in fact at odds. Rather, he argues that the Bible holds a wisdom surpassing all the Greek for all philosophers before them. Moreover, Oregon counters Celsius's allegation that Jesus performed miracles through magic rather than by the power of God, by asserting that Jesus's were miraculous occurrences and healings were never miracles that were aimed at producing a spectacle, which is the normal position of magic, but they were there to produce moral transformation. Against Celsius emerges as a landmark work in the early Christian discipline of what we today call apologetics, defences of the Christian faith. Prior to its publication, Christianity often faced dismissal as just a primitive belief system for the uneducated. Doesn't that sound familiar even today? Oregon's treaties in this book elevated Christianity to the realm at that time of intellectual respectability. It had such an impact that Eusebius, a round historian and theologian, lauded it as the best Christian work of that age. Of course, Oregon wrote many other things, some of which of them aren't available to this time. Between 232 and 235, during his time in Caesarea, he penned a work called On Prayer, the complete text of which has survived in its original Greek. The work begins with an explanation of the purpose, necessity and benefits of prayer and culminates in an analysis of the Lord's Prayer. Oregon concludes with insights on the proper posture, location and the mindset for approaching God in prayer, as well as different types of prayer. Another text called On Martyrdom, also preserved in Greek, was composed sometime after the onset of this Maximinist persecution in and around 235. Here Oregon is seen to admonish any compromise with idolatry and underscores the obligation to courageously embrace mar even martyrdom if necessary. As recently as 1941, Papare uncovered at Tura revealed that, gr that the Greek texts of two previously unknown works by Oregon were found there. Now, whilst the precise dating of them is uncertain, both are attested by experts to have been written post Maximus's persecution. One is entitled On the Passion, and the other is a dialogue with Heraclites, who was a bishop from Arabia. That dialogue, transcribed by one of Oregon's own stenographers, recounts the content of a debate between Oregon and Heraclites, who, although a Christian bishop, began to propagate and espouse a quasi monarchist belief. In this text, Oregon employs Socratic inquiry to advocate for what is called Logos theology, asserting the distinctiveness of the Son of God from the Father. Notably, the dialogue is characterized by its respectful tone, contrasting with the more competitive styles of figures like Tertullian or, or others during the future up-and-coming Trinitarian stroke Arian debates. Among Oregon's lost works are two volumes on the resurrection, both of which predated his monumental on the first principle work, as well as two dialogues on the same theme that were written and dedicated to Ambrose. Eusebius himself possessed over a hundred letters from Oregon, and Jerome's list, as I said, mentions several epistle collections, commentaries on the New Testament letters. However, apart from a few fragments of these, only two or three of these letters remain today. So that's his writings. So how can, how should we approach and distill Oregon's theological views? Well, we need to remember that Oregon was thoroughly familiar with Greek philosophy. He probably even studied under leading pagan philosophers. It's paradoxical and ironic that as one moves from Justin to Clement to Oregon, one witnesses increasing hostility towards philosophy, while at the same time seeing a steady increase in the absorption of philosophical ideas and philosophical 
arguments been used to defend Christianity. The philosophical element was especially acute in Oregon's writing, and because of that his orthodoxy have been debated by many from this day to ours. In the 4th century there was a powerful anti oregonist movement arose, and in the 6th century he was later condemned as a heretic, or possibly condemned as a heretic, more about that later. Yet still, to this day, he remains the single most influential father of what is called Greek theology. In terms of his views on the position of Christ, his Christology, Oregon posited that Jesus was the firstborn of all creation, and he took on human body and soul. He staunchly opposed what was called docetism, which claimed that Jesus only appeared in spiritual form, that he didn't in fact have a physical body. In Oregon's view, Jesus' human nature represents the epitome of fidelity regarding unwavering devotion, even as those around him faltered. At the moment of incarnation, Jesus' soul is seen to emerge with the Logos, he wrote, become unified as one. Thus, Oregon argued that Christ possessed fully both human and divine nature and attributes and that his human nature existed since the beginning, akin, as he argued, to all human souls. Oregon was also one of the first to explain the ransom theory of atonement, although it, in fairness its roots trace back to earlier theologians like Arrhenius and their understanding of the scriptures. According to this position, Christ's death serves as a ransom paid in exchange for humanity's freedom from sin. Now, some oppose this, perhaps because at this stage it wasn't fully formed to definitely state to whom that ransom was paid. Some misinterpreted that Oregon suggested that the ransom was paid to Satan other than to God. The concept, as Oregon states it, suggests that God in fact outwitted Satan because Christ, being sinless and the incarnate deity, was therefore beyond Satan's realistic grasp to be able to deflect from the main mission of the Father. The ransom theory was later developed further by later theologians such as Gregory of Nicaea and Rufus of Aquilina, eventually being pretty much universally adopted as the mainstream orthodox view and interpretation of what the scriptures plainly teach. In terms of his theology and cosmology and the end times, one of Oregon's most contentious teachings was the concept of the pre-existence of souls. According to this doctrine, before the creation even of the physical world, God crafted countless spiritual intelligences as he described them, souls we might say today. Now, initially these souls were wholly devoted to contemplating and loving their creator God. How over time, as their fervour for worshipping God was seen to wane, some grew disinterested, causing for some their love of their creator to diminish. When God fashioned the material world, these pre-existing souls were given physical bodies. Those whose love dwindled the most were actually ascribed as demons, and those with moderate decreases in love became human souls destined for exposure to the incarnated Son of God in Jesus. Those whose love remained relatively strong stayed in heaven as angels. Yet in the heavenly realms, Oregon wrote that there was one exceptional soul that maintained unwavering devotion to God through profound love. The soul merged with the divine word, the Logos of God, and eventually the Logos was incarnated as Jesus Christ, the God-man born of the Virgin Mary. However, let's be clear, there's a real debate about all of this stuff and whether Oregon himself actually exposed these beliefs or, because we don't have the original text to justify it, it is possible that they were all wholly and entirely attributed to him by later followers who wholly adopted this perspective. So we have to say that his true stance on reincarnation and other aspects of the spiritual realm must remain uncertain. In his life we know that he explicitly rejected certain forms of teaching on what was called soul transmigration, and some argue that it's just a confusion and an attempt to align his 
end times eschatology in a way that doesn't explicitly deny biblical text. What we can say about him in truth is he denied entirely the Stoic concept of eternal return through the, the idea of a succession through different created worlds or different levels of Gnostic secret spiritual knowledge. In regards to the universality of salvation, Oregon certainly believed in the eventual conversion of the entire world to Christianity, viewing it as all part of an ongoing process. He posits that the kingdom of heaven had not yet fully manifested and emphasized it was the duty of Christians to embody it in a sort of eschatological reality in their lives, thus bringing about the coming kingdom into the world. Whilst often labelled as a universalist, someone who suggested that all individuals might eventually be saved, Oregon presents this as a possibility rather than as a definitive doctrine, as a potentiality, he said. He always envisaged salvation as a purification process, whereas individuals would confront the anguish of their sin, symbolically as he believed described as divine fire. But despite suggestions of universal salvation, Oregon maintained individuals, all individuals, even Satan himself, all those who ultimately rejected the kingdom of God and free will could not partake in the final salvation. Oregon staunchly advocated a perspective of free will, rejecting the Valentinian notion of predestination. He believed that even disembodied souls retained the capacity to make choices. Of the outcomes of the decision people will make, he still defended free will by arguing that instances of divine foreknowledge, like Jesus knows, knowing Jesus' portrayal, did not negate the individual agency of the free choices that people make. Oregon reasoned that foreknowledge, yes it existed, it simply meant that God knew the choices that individuals would make therefore affirming the primacy and responsibility of us all to act in free will in this life. He, like many before him in sense, believed that true freedom, true expression of free will lay in choosing good over evil, with evil choices then becoming a form of enslavement and a resistance to making free will choices rather than completely undermining the idea of free will in itself. Additionally, we know Oregon championed an early form of Christian pacifism, asserting that Christianity, in essence, should include a commitment to nonviolence. Whilst acknowledging that there were Christians serving in the Roman army, he maintained that engaging in warfare contradicted Christ's teaching. He argued that a Christian participating in a war was someone who was compromising their faith, as Jesus, he said, inequivocally forbade violence. He interpreted the violence passages in the Old Testament allegorically and cited verses from the New Testament supporting non-violence to back this perspective. Oregon believed that if anyone embraced Christian principles of peace and love, then if everyone embraced the principles of Christian love of peace, then of course warfare would become unnecessary, and he envisaged a world devoid of conflict and even the need for military action in the future. And finally, when looking at his theology, we have to consider how he approached and interpreted scripture. Oregon's theological framework is deeply rooted in the authority of the Christian scriptures. Whilst Platonic teachings, although useful, they are secretary and they're only utilised after being corroborated by scriptural evidence. He regarded the scriptures as all divinely inspired and took great care not to contradict their explicit teaching. However, Oregon's speculative tendencies always led him into these ambiguous territories between orthodoxy and heresy. You see, according to Oregon, the Bible contained two types of literature, narrative and history, and of those two types, they were subdivided between passages which he saw as legalization or ethical. He emphasized the importance of reading both the Old and New Testaments together and followed the same interpretive principle. Oregon 
proposed that there were actually three levels of interpretation when approaching Scripture. Number one was the literal, the flesh. Number two that lay behind that was the moral, the soul. And number three was the spiritual. He considered the spiritual interpretation would be the deepest, the highest, the most significant, often spiritualizing some passages as being purely allegorical with no literal meaning. However, he acknowledges that historically accurate passages were more numerous in the Bible and more frequently be able to be used for worldly examples of Christian teaching. Oregon addressed any perceived contradictions in the Gospels by emphasizing the spiritual message lay beyond that rather than just their historical accuracy. He developed the concept of a twofold creation based on an allegorical reading of Genesis positing a primordial creation of spiritual beings followed by a secondary creation of human souls with eternal bodies. Each phrase of creation represented departure from the original state of the pure, original, unfallen creation. In chapter 4, verse 16 of his book on the first principles, he writes this, for whom that has understanding will suppose that the first and the second and the third day and even the morning existed without a sun, a moon and stars, and that the first day was, as it were, also without a sky. And who is so foolish as to suppose that God, after the manner of a husbandman, planted a garden in Eden towards the east and placed a tree of life there, visible and palpable, so that one tasting of the fruit by the bodily teeth obtained life? And again, that one who was a partaker of good and evil by masticating what was taken from the tree. And if God was said to walk in the paradise in the evening, and Adam to hide himself under a tree, I do not suppose that anyone doubts that these things figuratively indicate certain mysteries, the history having taken place in appearance and not literally. Many of us would see this as pushing the boundaries of what might be considered an orthodox approach to the scriptures. Oregon himself only ever wanted to be orthodox, an orthodox Christian. In fact, the bulk of his writings were devoted to his explanation of the Bible. Yet even here, there are some basic problems. Oregon felt the Bible could not be properly understood without the extensive use of allegory. Parts of the Old Testament he thought offensive, taken literally. These were therefore put there to allow us give us the need, the desire to seek a deeper hidden meaning, he said. They are given to inspire us to seek out allegory beyond the literal interpretation. Now, Oregon did not invent the allegorical method of understanding scripture. It was something that had been used by Greeks and it has attempted to derive some positive ideas from the myths and legends and the nefarious exploits of some of the Greek gods. In fact, it was first applied the Old Testament itself by Jewish theologians as well, like Philo in the first century AD. His primary aim was to bring the Old Testament into line with Greek thought using the allegory method. Oregon's approach, the Christian Bible, was similar. His use of allegory enabled him to evade the literal meaning of the text where he found it unacceptable or too challenging. And it was perhaps that which allowed him to interpret the Bible with such a harmony in Greek thought, thereby reaching people who were exploring it from a Greek worldview. Now that doesn't mean that that was Oregon's conscious aim, it's that he simply believed that he was drawing out the real truth that lay behind the text. The tension between orthodoxy and heresy in Oregon's writing is probably most clearly seen in his doctrine of the Trinity. He vehemently opposed this idea of monarchanism, the idea of the father as representing king and holy king and being our way over and above other expressions of the God. He saw that and all other theories similar with minimizing the threeness of God. He insisted, Oregon that is, that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are eternally three and felt that the monarchists in their call to describe the people as the second and the third person of the Trinity might suggest that they were born or begotten or generated at one particular moment in time thereafter. He said that the Son is eternally generated, begotten by the Father, 
not born by the father. This was an eternal possession of a relationship and not an event, something that had happened once in eternity. It was something that was always eternally happening, according to Oregon. Oregon's understanding of God the Father is deeply rooted in not what he said or did, but in his perfect goodness, that is God. Therefore, portraying him as a perfect unity lying beyond human comprehension transcends material existence and therefore even transcends space and time. God is unchangeable. God is omnipotent. His goodness, his justice and his wisdom are the things that one and the same time constrain and contain his power. The revelation of God, including the Logos, is seen as the internal manifestation of God himself. The only way where it was possible for God to mediate between the divine unity that he was and the created world. This Logos, according to Oregon, as described in John, is the rational principle permitting the universe to exist and guiding human beings towards the truth through their capacity for logic, rational thought, all of which was a sort of human progress towards Christ-likeness, a way in which they could retain their individuality and free will, whilst at the same time demonstrating God's essential role as the mediator between God and the creative world. Oregon uses that same argument to move that creation is eternal. He believes that not just the word or reason, the logos, but that all rational beings who he describes as logosi, we have all existed eternally and will exist eternally. He argues that the process of salvation is in fact the reversal of the fall, ending by nature, he feels, with all rational, Logosi-inspired beings being, again, contemplating, worshipping, living with God. No question Oregon's contribution to Trinitarian theology are significant, as he affirmed the Holy Spirit firmly as part of the Godhead and emphasised the necessary of all three parts of the Trinity, all three persons of the Trinity, as necessary for salvation. There's no question the ideas he contributed to theological discussions ultimately shaped the orthodox view on the Trinity in later centuries. So what about his influence on the later church? Oregon's legacy in Christian theology is profound and far-reaching, and he's widely regarded as the first major Christian theologian. His influence has extended across the generations and across worldwide Christian theological positions and traditions. Whilst his orthodoxy was questioned during his lifetime, Oregon's theology gained prominence, particularly after his death. Now, of course, some of Oregon's disciples interpreted his theology in different ways, leading to diverse emphases on different aspects of his teachings. And these interpretations, in and of themselves, spark controversies dividing Christians, dividing people, particularly concerning his doctrines of the unity of the Trinity and spiritual heavenly landscape that he described. For centuries, Oregon was celebrated as a model of orthodoxy, particularly in Eastern Christianity. He shaped the theological landscape there profoundly. However, as theological thinking changed, shifted over time, Oregon became under criticism in later areas, with some theologians even reaching the point where they judged him against the orthodoxy of their own time rather than within the context in which he lived. And they judged as much the things he was said to have said as the things he actually said. Ultimately, Oregon's influence transcended many theological boundaries. It impacted both orthodox and heterodox theologians. Athanasius of Alexandria and the Cappadocian Fathers were deeply influenced by his theology, contributing to the ongoing development of what would later be arrived at and considered an orthodox Trinitarian doctrine. 
Conversely, Oregon's teaching also influenced Arius of Alexandria and later followers of Arianism, leading to some to attribute the Arian heresy itself to Oregon himself. But the extent of this relationship and inspiration remains debated to this day. An important step came with the Council of Constantinople in 533, the Second Council in fact, because there a letter was issued condemning Oregon as a leader of what was called the Iso Christoriae. Oregon's name appears in the list of those condemned. However, it has to be said the teachings that were being attributed to him at that time were actually those of later organists, particularly a guy, a guy called Ponticius, not what Oregon himself said, what later people said he said, or what they said about what he said. Some scholars even suggest that Oregon's name was actually retrospectively inserted into this condemnation text released by the council. Henry Chadwick, a scholar of early Christianity, in the text of his article on him in the Encyclopedia Britannica, writes this, If orthodoxy were a matter of intention, no theologian could be more orthodox than Oregon, none more devoted to the cause of the Christian faith. So Oregon's legacy is complex to this day, marked by controversies, debates over his theological ideas and interpretations of scripture. Despite condemnation of his work and the loss of many of his writings, Oregon remains a central figure in Christian theology to this day. Throughout the Middle Ages particularly, Oregon's influence persisted, with his works being translated and studied, particularly in Western Europe. Figures like Maximus the Confessor, John Scotus, Erasmus, they continued to draw from Oregon's writing, albeit still interpreting it within their own context in which they lived. The Renaissance itself saw a renewed interest in the teachings of Oregon, with scholars like Erasmus championing his theological insights and emphasizing his contributions to Christian thought. However, Oregon's view on salvation and free will drew criticism from reformers like Martin Luther, leading even to the banning of his writings in certain reform circles. Despite varying opinions on his theological position, Oregon's significance in the development of early Christian thought has to be widely acknowledged. His emphasis on scriptural interpretation as the basis of the exploration of all theological concepts has left an enduring lasting impact in our whole understanding of Christian theology. And while his status remains debate, his intellectual legacy continues to be studied and, it be said, appreciated by scholars across many and all different Christian traditions. So in summary, there is a truth in perhaps that in saying that the 4th century charge that made against him that he was blinded by Greek culture in his approach to scripture, as one even accused him of introducing Platonism into the Bible, Yet still we see Oregon setting out the apostolic tradition aligned with the Holy Scriptures as the ultimate test for orthodoxy. The apostles, he believed, delivered certain terms to all believers and Oregon was one of the first to list them for us. They are to be accepted by the foundations of theology, he said, but also noting that the wise and spiritual Christian can move beyond these doctrines as long as he does not contradict them, moving from the milk of the word of God to the strong meat, as described by Paul. As with many of these early church leaders, including Irenaeus and Tertullian before him, as the foundation of Christian thought was further developed, it tended to emerge out of a Greek worldview. So whilst we can clearly see in most of his main doctrines the orthodoxy of his position maintained today. He can explain that Christ died for our sins and on the cross he was ransomed for us, but he still manages to reach a position that saying that teaching is the basic teaching for the common herd so that those who can understand that and know more can be saved by that simple doctrine, but he says that is a teaching for the common herd and that there is an opportunity for those to go above and beyond it.
For him, the whole essence of salvation is about putting ourselves in a position, being like gold and being re refined in the fire through contemplating God himself. The soul needs to rise in the world of becoming into the realm of being. And it is the word of God, subsequent to the re reception of salvation, that is the tool, the power that enables us to do this. The knowledgeable Christian, he says, will penetrate beyond the earthly Jesus to the internal word and achieve. The refining of our souls is achieved through contemplating him. This concept of salvation is seen by some as thoroughly Greek and has more to do with Gnosticism of the day than it has to do with the Jewish form of biblical Christianity out of which it arose. So the big question then today for us, of course, is was Oregon a heretic? Was his theology simply Thetanism for the masses? That is the question that will be continue to be asked and is still asked to this day. But two things I think we can clearly state. There is no doubting Oregon's fervent desire to be orthodox and his belief that he actually was and the sincerity of his devotion to Christ and his dedication to a life of Christian service. Equally, we can say his actual theology was totally permeated by Greek thought and Platonism. The Platonism, although, is not like the icing that sits on top of a cake or the currents within a cake, which can be removed, as one apt description I read of it, he said, but his Platonism was more like a sherry flavouring everything and is inseparable from the cake itself. From a biblical perspective, Oregon's writing and theology need and should and are often approached with caution and criticism. Why study means they're always held within the context of the time in which he lived. Whilst we can acknowledge his contributions to early Christian thought, many from within the Protestant tradition would view him as a controversial figure whose teachings often appeared to deviate from orthodox doctrine in quite significant ways. One area of common concern is Oregon's desire to frequently allegorize scripture. Whilst allegory, of course, has its place in biblical interpretation, I believe we should prioritize first the literal meaning of the text unless there is clear evidence to suggest otherwise. Oregon's tendency, I think many would say, was to spiritualize passages that weren't necessarily meant to be allegorized in that way and can be seen from departing from this principle of sola scriptura, leading to possible misunderstandings, many of which would say I've catalogued today. Another point of contention is, of course, Oregon's potential doctrine of universalism, by which he says that all rational beings will ultimately be restored to a state of harmony with God. This belief pretty much runs counter totally to the Protestant understanding of salvation, which emphasizes the necessity of faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation and the reality of an internal judgment for those who permanently reject him from a position of free will. Although, to be fairness to him, it's not a position that I personally believe he took. I think it was rather those who took on an Oregonist worldview, if you like, who followed on in his name, who developed that side of his theology. Some would say that Oregon's view on the nature of Christ should also raise concerns, particularly the fact that he had a sort of subordinate perspective, which posits that the Son is subordinate to the Father and the Holy Spirit is subordinate in a sense to the Son. This, I believe, also confirms with Reformed Christian belief, Orthodox Christian belief, many would say, in the co-equality and co-eternity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we see expressed in the likes of the Nicene Creed. Oregon taught the threeness of God, but in a sense, he's open to the accusation that he in fact created the Trinity. The Father is greater than the Son, and the Son is greater than the Holy Spirit, and that the Father alone, almost it appears to say that the Father alone is the true God. Thus, many would say Oregon's Trinity is a three-tree Trinity, God at three different levels. In the following century, people like Arrhenius would take this further, concluding that only the Father is really God, 
and that the Son and Holy Spirit were in fact created creatures. And furthermore, of course, Origins, we can only describe it as speculative theology regarding his teaching on the pre-existence of souls and the predestination of individuals based on pre-existent actions is viewed with skepticism by many theologians today and is probably the natural end when you take this ultra allegorical method of approaching scriptures. Such speculative elements can lead to theological ambiguity at best and at worst can undermine the clarity and the core of the gospel message. Despite these criticisms, most Christians of many backgrounds would recognize Oregon's historical significance and his huge contribution to early Christian theology. However, I believe we still must always, as in all things, approach his writings and his life with discernment weighing his insights against the authoritative standard of scripture and the doctrinal formulations of the idea that salvation is by faith alone, through faith in Christ alone. Thanks for being with me today.